Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. Laura, how are you? I'm doing well today, Paul. It's great to be here as always, and I'm excited for the conversation we have ahead of us. I am as well. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with the title later. I've already got a couple uh, <laughs> percolating in my head, but we're going to talk about uh, innovation. What is it? Where did it come from? Why? What makes us tick? Uh, as well as I think a, I have a, a sense, a number of other topics about where the future may take us. Laura, do you want to uh, uh, introduce our guest? Sure. So today we're speaking with Byron Reese, a longtime serial entrepreneur who somehow finds time to write books about artificial intelligence in the future. So with that, Byron, welcome to the show. Um, thanks for being with us today. And, and let's dive in. For the benefit of our listeners, please tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I think you covered the highlights. I live in Austin, Texas. Um, my wife and I homeschooled four kids from all the way through K through 12. And uh, and that's why I started writing books very early in the morning, because it was the only time when uh, there was nobody up. So I, I write books before I go to, uh, to work, and then I, I work a day job. Excellent. And uh, I have a company that I'm uh, struggling with, as always. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Well, uh Listen, we we have a number of different paths to to go down, but let's 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 start with your your most recent book, which I you know it was a thorough I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading. It's uh, entitled "Stories, Dice, and Rocks That Think." I, I looked at this, wow, this is going to be you know very interesting, um, and it was. Um, I I'd almost describe it. I don't know, Byron, you know, maybe subtitle it the uh, anthropology of innovation. Um, it's so that's good. It, yeah, you like that? Yeah, I do. I do. You should get a nickel every time somebody says it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, what caught me, and, I, and I'll, for, for our, our listeners' uh, benefit, my, you know, my, uh, my Amazon review would be, I think it's, a, it's just a, a great walkthrough uh, in terms of the history, you know, which, and it obviously is, this changes every, you know, time we get new DNA analysis reshapes our hist the history of our past, but what in our past makes us different than other creatures? What's driving us to innovate? What is um, what is innovation? What are the collection of attributes of our, our humanness uh, that leads us to create and do different things? And, and um, I think, Byron, you focused on society. You know, my head obviously is driven to kind of let into corporations and organizations uh, about this, but um, Tell us, like, you know, maybe just give us sort of the walkthrough. I mean, you, 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 you know, you start with, you know, talking about, you know, rocks. I, you know, and Laura and I were talking about the, you know, the the famous scene from two thousand and and one, Space Odyssey. You know, you throw the throw the bone up, and it turns into a hammer. For those of you who have not <laughs> actually watched the show, but um, and we were thinking almost in our business, it's you know, you toss the, we we do a little uh, TikTok here with throwing, tossing paper forms into the air and they come back to us as iPhones that uh, interpret and see and already have figured out our risk profile. But tell us about a book and and, and maybe you, you, how do you describe the book and, and uh, you know, what inspired you to to, uh, to write this? Well, um, curiosity inspired me to write it. I, I, uh, I, I really just started with the question of why are why, why is our outcome as a species so different than other creatures? And I think if, if you want to think about innovation, the place to start the story is with a creature that does not innovate. And there was a, there was a creature named Homo erectus, who is said to be our uh, ancestor. And Homo erectus lived 1.6 million years, a long run, and was very successful. And, um, but Erectus only had one tool, and they lived so long, and they and you can find these tools scattered all over Asia, Africa, and Europe, that you can actually buy one of them, a tool that was used a million years ago for like $100 on eBay. And what's notable about it is, um, is that in that 1.6 million years, you can think of that as 80,000 generations, the tool never changed. You can't tell one, two that were made a million years apart, apart. Uh, because, and so that's almost impossible to do because you can't really have 
80,000 generations go by and nobody look at this thing and say, huh, I wonder if it would be better if blank. And the answer to the riddle is, um, I think Erectus didn't know what they were doing when they made it. That is not a technological object. It's not a cultural object. It's just a genetic object. Erectus would carve this one tool, this giant arrowhead looking thing, uh, the way a bird builds a nest or a beaver builds a dam, actually not knowing what they're doing or why. I mean, if you put a recording of running water in a field and a beaver walks by, they'll build a dam around it. Like, they don't fundamentally know what they're doing, and that's what these tools are. And the reason you can know that is if every erectus just copied their parents, then it would drift a little bit, like the telephone game, and every generation would just be a little different. And then after 80,000 generations, you'd have a plethora of poop that you don't. And then you can trust that to us. And it took us three generations to get from Kitty Hawk to the moon. It took us 125 generations to get from the first writing to William Shakespeare. It took us 250 generations uh, to get from our first use of precious metals to our world financial uh, thing. So we are something very different. And the cool thing about it is our ability to innovate, to do all of that, appears to have come to us with, in an instant, and it appears to have come with a lot of other features. Now, the with an instant part, we think is true because the archaeological record, that what it shows is nothing, 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 and then we appear. So you take it something like cave art, where you would assume, like way back, it was like stick figures on the cave wall, and then maybe they added a triangle for a dress after a thousand years, and then whatever, they went all along. And then eventually got better and better and better. And then, but that's not what we see. What we see is nothing. And then we see the caves at Chauvet, which are beautiful pieces of art, like things you would be proud to have hanging on your wall. Uh, uh, and, and then, and this is a highly technical thing because they clearly had to build scaffolding because they're way up high and they prepared the surface. They used animal fat to uh, make it adhere. They used talc to extend it. They insisted on getting a black that, but they didn't want charcoal because it's just dark gray. They wanted black. And the closest source for mineral they could turn into black pigment is 140 miles away. And then once you get it, you have to heat it to 1,600 degrees to, to do it. So all of a sudden, you have to have this image of these of a rectus who does nothing but makes this one tool that they instinctually know how to make. And then all of a sudden, we appear. And and at that same instant that, we, that, that, that cave art appears, you find the first musical instruments. You find the first representations of, of creatures like animals or people. And so what you see, I think, is a story of, of, of we came along and, and we were bitten by this radioactive spider or something, and we were endowed with all of these abilities. And I think the key one, I think the key one, and I'm wrapping up here, the key one I think is language. And the important thing about language is not how we use it to communicate that came later if you think about it it's spoken language is a kludge you don't have any body parts for it you have to repurpose other body parts to be able to speak because you know your tongues for eat food and your lungs are for breathing and all of that uh the main purpose of language is for thought it's the way we organize our thoughts and that's more than speculation because there's a really really great quote in the book from helen keller who talks about what her life was like before her teacher came and she she says she didn't even know she was a thing different than the universe and she didn't know that there was time and she didn't know what she was or how she fit in or anything and then she got language and she said it, it was in that moment i became conscious so now to wrap that up is you have to imagine millions of years where this this creature just made this stone and then somehow something happened to us and you know, kapow, the world was opened and, and we were in, given all of these abilities to be able to innovate and to create uh, and do all the rest. And, and the important thing about human innovation is that it accumulates because so you're not born into a, a blank slate. You were born into a, a world. And that's why I think you have so many concurrent inventions, right? Because all, everything's moving forward. Our whole you know, our knowledge gains and compounds and grows and grows and grows. And then all of a sudden you can do these things and we, we do a lot of them. So I think uh, we, we learn to innovate in, in kind of that moment.
And then all of a sudden we're bringing scaffolding and hiking 140 miles to get halcyonite to make black pigment and all. I mean, like now we can't not innovate. You can't not look at something and say, hmm, that would be better if. So I think that's how we became, you know, homo innovatus or, or whatever, the, the innovating person. Now, you also talk about stories, the power of stories, and, and the ability to, th to think about the past, but also think about the future. And I think, um, yeah, so t right. t tell us a little bit more about wh wh why are stories so important? We, we, we know it, we say it, we think it. You know, I think right. marketers are all t today, I think, are, are – <laughs> talking about stories all the time. I think people have maybe over-recognized, but why, why were stories so important to uh, uh, lead us to, to Kitty Hawk and then lead us to the moon? Right. Well, just like um, the main purpose of language wasn't, I don't think, to, to communicate, but to think, uh, that same thing is true for stories. We, we didn't just invent stories to sit around a campfire and tell them to each other we invented stories uh, to think with. Now, when you look at human abilities versus what animals are able to do, one thing that, you, you know, you've got language and you've got all these other things, but one is that animals don't know that there's a future and a past. Now, there's no reason they should because those two things don't exist. They, I mean, they're, they're, they're fictions. Uh, the only thing that's real is this moment right here. And the future and the past are, are imaginary things that don't exist. But we, uh, we use them. And we have episodic memory, which means you, we remember specific things in the past, which animals don't seem to. And, um, and we can imagine the future, and animals don't seem to be able to do that. There may be two or three that can think an hour or two out, but none of them are investing in 401ks or anything like that, like just – if they have a time horizon, it's so compact. And so what we did, what humans did, is we started using stories to run scenarios in our head, which we do to the, today, all day long. Uh, you can imagine, you know, way back in the day, somebody's looking at a, they're at a hill, and they can see up at the top, there's some ripe-looking berries or fruit tree or something, and they're like, I want some of that. And they're like, how will I get it, though? I will... I will go around to the back of the hill and go up there because there's a trail. No, no, there's a there's a bear that lives over there. I don't want to deal with that bear. Okay, I'll do this. Um, and so moment by moment, we tell ourselves stories. We draw up on specific things in the past, and we tell ourselves stories about the future. And that's how we think. That's how we operate. Your whole life is just a series of these kind of stories of uh, where you contemplate the future by thinking of the past. And that's really our success as a species. Because if you could imagine two creatures, one knew there was a future, could use the past to predict it, and one didn't. Like, which of those two is going to be uh, the, the, the successful one? And that turned out to be us. Yeah. Only later, only later did we start uh, telling these stories. And the book recounts 20, uh, 21, if you read the secret last page, 21 purposes of stories. And uh, because we found that they were these powerful things that we could all relate to and so we could use them to teach morality we could use them to uh correct behavior we could use them to inspire all of these things you think of normally yeah well let's talk just a we'll, we'll, we'll connect the dots for our listeners with insurance and innovation so you actually talk about the uh the invention of mortality tables you know in uh in, in i think france correct yeah and uh okay how did insurance creep into this? You've got an insurance so, background. I, I was, before we started recording, I mentioned my father sold insurance for 33 years. I grew up in, in a home and I, I licked many an envelope with sales materials in it. Uh, and so I was, section two of the book is, so section one is how we start thinking in stories. And therefore we could imagine the future, but we didn't know how to predict the future. And that's a very different thing. So section two, which is dice, is how we studied, uh, how we got, um, how we invented probability to uh, to be able to forecast the future. It's really interesting. May I use a visual aid real quickly? Absolutely. 
the 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 funny thing is is that if you want to predict the future, you have to know why the future happens the way it does. Like, why do things happen one way and not another? And there were a lot of theories about that in antiquity. You know, it's fated to happen. Or it had to happen. It was by necessity. A leads to B leads to C leads to D. The Big Bang leads to you stubbing your toe this morning. It's inevitable. And all these different views. The one that nobody ever thought of was that the future is random. And if at first that seems pretty bleak, it seems pretty bleak. Like, what do you do with that? But then we learned something. You can see these at a science museum. Uh, what you see are down here a bunch of BBs. And when I flip it, the BBs are going to start falling. And they're going to hit a little plastic piece of plastic. And they can go to the left or the right. And then they're going to hit another one. They can go to the left and the right all the way down. And when you do it, what you see is they Our form normal a normal distribution. Distribution curve. And right. you can do this all day long. And if it ever forms a giant U shape, well, the world's going to end or, <laughs> or because it's not going to happen. So it. although we found out the world was random, the future was random, we found there was an enormous amount of predictability in that. And that's a very hard thing to wrap your head around. But this is, this is randomness. That's all that is. And yet it has high predictability. So once we realized that, we, we could do all these other things. One of them was that the way governments used to sell annuities to raise money uh, was you could come and you could give the uh, the government um, seven dollars. This that would be a real number, but seven to one. You give them seven dollars, and then they'll pay you a dollar a year for the rest of your life. Some governments it was eight dollars to one. Now the important thing is. They didn't change that based on your age. So if an 80-year-old person and a 20-year-old person both walked in the door and said, I have an annuity, uh, I want to buy an annuity, uh, I want a dollar a year in income, they would tell them both, $7, kick it over. And you think, well, why would they do that? Because it sure seems like you're going to be paying that 20 dollars guy a whole lot longer than that 80 dollars guy. But they believed that your chance like explicitly believed your chances of dying in a given year had nothing to do with your age. Now, it's a forgivable thing on the one hand, because if you live in a world where there's a lot of premature death, it would look like that. You know, a, your, the mule kicked somebody in the head and killed them. But well, it doesn't matter if they were 20, 30, 50, or 80. Somebody's getting kicked in the head with the mule. It doesn't matter how old they are. Your chances of dying are all, you know, the same. It doesn't matter. Now, that's why it's forgivable. The reason it's not forgivable is on one Sunday afternoon, you could walk around a cemetery and write down the ages of people at death, and you could say, ha-ha, actually, it turns out old people die more often than young people in a given year. And that's what we didn't know. And so then uh, they, they started making these, these, these tables that could... Uh, and But you have to understand, it's such a mindset, it's, it's a different mindset, because before death you know, was capricious, death you know, would, would, would put his cold fingers on somebody's shoulder, almost it seemed at random. And now all of a sudden, death looks like a mathematical formula. It looks like uh, when you're going to die, it looks like an equation. And that's a different way to think about the world. Um, and so from there, we went uh, and we we took that. No, I'll pause there. And that's, that's how that all got started and how we learned how to price annuities more more intelligently. I mean, there's there's so many paths we could go down anywhere from, you know, asking a question around our acorns and other nuts like the 401k for squirrels, all the way, you know, rewinding back to something most recent you said about randomness, um, you know, and predictability. So in thinking about the, the image that you just showed us um, on screen there, has the predictability within randomness changed how you've run your businesses as an entrepreneur? Or as if you grow your business. Asked, yep. Right. If somebody had asked me, if I flip a coin a thousand times, how many times is it going to come up heads? I now know to answer that around 500, right? But I've only been taught that. It's not intuitive to me in the least. In fact, because I've never done it, but it seems to me like sometimes it would be 200. And then sometime, maybe next time it'll be 800. And then next time it'll be 500. Next time it'll be 900. Like, why would it, 
why would it matter like if, if all the tosses are independent like wouldn't it be all over the map the truth is the truth is is that the odds of it being under 400 or over 600 is one in many billions it will never happen has never happened in the history of and that's a hard thing to wrap one's mind around because uh, it just doesn't intuitively seem right. And so I think the way I apply this is I think I make more than average number of, um, you know, we have these, we have these uh, limits to our own cognition of what all these different ways that our instincts are kind of wrong. And uh, I have been humbled by those a lot. And so I would say if anything is I, um, I guess I'm less trustful of my instincts about numbers and uh, more and just reasoning in general, because you should almost not believe everything that you think because your thinking has inherent flaws. Like you think in the world of business, how do we decide whether to do A or B? Let's say you're a CEO and there's people who want to do A and people who want to do B. And uh, you're, in a, you're in a meeting and they kind of, everybody kind of makes their case. So the A person stands up and says, we should do A. And then the B person stand, says, we should do. If you're the CEO, like trying to decide between those, you're going to end up picking whoever was better at persuading you. Now, that may seem like, of course, but the person who is better at persuading you is no more likely to be right than the other person. They're just better at arguing. And... Uh, and so you, you start to kind of get, uh, well, and so I think there are things like that where I have, um, you know, there, I, I, there's an old saying about the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their true name. And, and I, I always try to sink back to that. And I always try to, um, and then you might say, well, wait a minute, if, if, if you can't decide that way on who, um, on who argues the best or who then how do you, how, how do you, if, if your instincts are wrong, if, if you're going to miss guess the number of times a coin turns up heads, you can't touch these, you can't trust these smooth talking arguers because they're just, you know, eight years of speech and debate did that to me because <laughs> it's, um, you argue for something, then against it, then for it, then against it, for it, then against it. And you realize it doesn't matter which side you're arguing, uh, the better debater will win. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and so you say, well, how do you, how do you, what were you saying? No, no, I, oh, I, no. I, how do you then decide? How do you then decide? Um, and, and I, I guess that uh, for me, I fail in business many more times than I succeed. I, I wish there was a cute, funny, but, <laughs> but there isn't like, it's just my fact of life is that I fail much more often than I succeed. I, only make up for it because I do lots of things. I, I do lots of st things, uh, but I, I don't, good ideas and bad ideas are identical on one side of time. And then a month later, it's like, that was the worst idea I've ever had. In my I mean, I'll give you a, a, a real example of that. If, okay, so I had these websites that were getting a lot of traffic and I needed to uh, monetize that traffic. And I said, well, I'm just gonna start a bunch of businesses. And, and, and run ads on my pages. So uh, I started two on the same day. One of them was musical tele uh, singing telegrams delivered over the telephone. For $10, you could go to this website, type in your friend's phone number, pick their date, uh, their birthday, and then listen to these little snippets. Some are funny and all that. And at the point in time, somebody would call them and sing the song. The other one, for the same $10, by the way, uh, were letters from Santa Claus to your kid mailed out of North Pole, Alaska. So they came with the North Pole postmark. Now, both of those were my idea. We did them both. And uh, for the singing telegram one, nobody bought one. Nobody. I mean, none. Zero. Not, not, I didn't get a pity order. I didn't, my mother didn't order one. Nobody did. The other one, the other one, I've now sold uh, 900,000 of those letters. Um, and that worked out really well. It was a good idea. Now I couldn't have told them apart. And so th there's a quote about enlightened. There's a quote about how enlightened trial and error outperforms the reasoning of a flawless intellect. And yes. that's sort of the only thing I can do is 
and like and trial and error. And so what I think I got better at is trying things. And um, and another thing, I, I, I don't mean to be all over the map, but another thing that was very helpful to me is I, um, I changed the language I used when I talked about my businesses. Because, you know, was, like I would say that was a bad idea or that worked. The last thing I wanted to do was make that about me, either of those, because the minute I'm like, oh, I failed or I succeeded, uh, then you're just intermixing all of your own emotions into the decision making. But if you can't distance yourself and say, that was a terrible idea, I'd be like, ha, should fire the guy that had that idea. Like whoever, he, oh, that was me. Anyway, <laughs> it's like separate yourself from it. And then, and it works both ways because then when you finally do have some amount of success, you know, you're not all that, you know, you're just, uh, that was a good idea. Like that idea worked. All right. Great. But neither of those change your worth or your should change your worth or your image of yourself. So all of it to say, I try to do enlightened trial and error. I try to keep my ego out of it. I try to, um, look past all the obvious things that, and, and all of kind of my intuitions and all of that, which are notoriously poor. And I try to quickly find out if something's going to work or not. In, in line trial and error, in error, we had a, a great discussion with Roger Martin about experiments. You know, his, 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 his word, his, his framing of the same issue. And, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think back to the, the, uh, model you showed us. Um, I think a lot of venture capital portfolio management strategy works like that, right? I, I'm going to get a team of people and over the course of, four years or five years, I'm going to find the most perfectly round BBs to put in this container. And if I get enough of them, <laughs> I, I think it'll work. I just don't know which ones. I don't know which ones are going to construct that. Like you, you, like your, your idea of singing Telegram. Okay, well, hmm. Gee, Barma, what, what if we actually did this with video? And what if the video were celebrities? Oh, Cameo. Right? <laughs> uh, it, uh, right. yeah, I hadn't made that connection. That's right. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, that was the idea. I, I you know, I, I love you know thinking of you know some of these companies that blew up in the 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 dot com uh, bubble burst. Who's going to want pet food online? Really? Uh, <laughs> you know, oh, that was such a dumb. You know, th think all those dumb things everybody put down. You know, today they they, they work. It was just wrong time, wrong. You know, there's, or right. let me put it this way. There were better options, better timing for things. And, you know, it was, I do, to your point that the, I, the, th the logic was perfect. It just wasn't, there's was one element that missed. It may have been something as simple as you didn't have the cash in the bank to keep your business running. You know, if you went, if you went back in time to uh, 30 years to what would that be? 25 years ago, yeah, 97, to the early days of the consumer internet, um, and you showed somebody a browser, and you said, what is that going to do to jobs? They would have said, uh, oh, it's going to be bad. Uh, all the travel agents are going out of business, yes. and all the stockbrokers, all the newspapers will go under, the yellow pages are going under, the shopping malls are going to start closing. And you know what? They would have been right about everything. But nobody, back, nobody, if you took that back to 97, nobody would have said, oh my gosh, there's going to be Uber and Airbnb and Twitter and Facebook. There's going to be Amazon and Google and uh, all of it, all the millions of jobs. And there's a reason we didn't have um, ride sharing until 06 or something. It, it, there is, when a new technology comes out, you can only understand it in terms of what it replaces. When when TV first came out, people said, what is TV? And they said, it's just like radio, but it's got pictures. And so people just took radio shows and then they had people behind microphones and they filmed them reading the scripts. It was radio with pictures. That's all it was. You couldn't get Breaking Bad in 1952. It just, you cannot mentally do that. Nobody can. Uh, and, and likewise uh, with the internet. And that's why all this worry about automation and jobs, uh, I think is, is, is uh, misplaced because you can always see what's going to be destroyed. It's really easy. And that can look very frightening, but you can't see all the stuff it's going to make. Uh, and that's the part of the equation you can't see. And 
when if you if you start with the basic belief that technology increases productivity, then you have to say, well, that's a good thing. That's always a good thing. Because if it isn't, well, then you should advocate for a law that you know requires people to work with one arm tied behind their back. Because you would then create a bunch of jobs. You would need a lot more people to do anything. But their productivity would go way down, and so uh, those jobs wouldn't pay. And so when you start by saying technology is this thing that increases human productivity and that's always good for humans, then you can have a lot, you can breathe a lot deeper to say, yeah, I can see where this technology is going to destroy this stuff, uh, but uh, I just can't see what it's going to create. And then you can look back on 250 years of economic history in this country and say, I've spent a long time trying to figure out the half-life of a job, and I think it's 50 years. I think every 50 years we lose half of all the jobs, every 50 years. I think it's been going on for 250, 300 years. I don't see it really speeding up or slowing down, really. I can't tell that the velocity is changing any. Um, but then you have to say, well, how do you destroy all your job, half your jobs every 50 years and maintain full employment against rising wages? And that's because... Uh, ever, for, you know, when it, when technology comes in and increases people's productivity, then it creates these new opportunities for them, and they kind of everybody kind of just shifts up this curve just a little bit at a time, as we use technology to automate really really rote things, and we use it to create new opportunities, and then everybody kind of shifts up a notch, and uh, and that's kind of I think the basic thing that gives me confidence about economically confident about the future. So bringing together storytelling and technology, we've seen, you know, the Twitters, the Facebook, TikTok, et cetera, and rewinding hundreds, thousands of years, campfires sitting around telling stories. You know, I, I see where I sit as a millennial, I see the value in the technology storytelling, and I see value in sitting around the campfire and storytelling with, with friends. Do you think at some point in all of your research, if you were to trust your gut or not trust your gut on this and make a guess, looking forward into the future, do you think that we're always going to be using technology to help assist us in that storytelling? Or do you think we're going to get to a point as beings where we say, technology aside, we're going to go back to uh, just human to human interactive storytelling? Which of the two do you think is going to be the most powerful, technology assisted or non-technology assisted? It's really interesting how technology gets applied to storytelling o over time. So you have to think back to um, when the printing presses came out. You know, Gutenberg era. They they reprinted whatever they had on hand, which basically were uh, religious works and then work uh, works of uh, antiquity, ancient Greece and Rome, and then they ran out of that. And then they needed to do something novel. And so they said, why don't we make something called the novel? And that's where we got that word. Like, that's the new stuff. And that's what, what it was. And then they started telling these stories. But when you read the, you know, novels, um, well, anyway, so all of it to say, what, what I think happens basically is it is it uh, layers on each other. Like, you could see a Shakespeare play performed at the Globe, theater in 1611 and that was done one way and you can in, in whatever city you live in probably find Shakespeare performed that way the same words with no additional technology performed just like that but I think what happens is we keep layering more and more layers of it over us I read these amazing numbers about how many hours a day of media we consume and I think they must double count like when you're at work and you you know you got a video playing and whatever because it, it's almost like 24 hours a day or something it's a huge number like that we seem to uh be insatiable we seem to not have we have not reached peak story yet we have not reached the point where we're like uh no thank you and so i think we're just going to keep layering more and more ways we still tell stories on, on top of it all but you'll always be able to see a shakespeare play you, you know, and, and I, I, I think back to the, when, when, um, I think back to when, uh, silent movies came out in, in Japan, they, uh, they would have a person who would, uh, kind of articulate what's going on in the story. The, basically the, the storyteller 
was still telling the story, but now there were these images going on that were in sync with it. And, and so that was like a way to, to enhance that with storytelling. I read so many storybooks when I was doing this book because I felt like that was just, I needed to just bury myself in them. Uh, just constantly just be reading fables and parables and all of these things. And uh, they're all still so, and I would watch these videos at the Storytelling Festival in Tennessee, and, and they're, they're all still so compelling. So I think what the thing is, 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 is that our appetite wants more, but we don't necessarily want to change them. I mean, we don't, you know, we're less, um, anyway, uh, we'll leave it at that. So uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of listeners who are driving change, making change, leading change inside some pretty big hives. <laughs> uh, w what advice would you give them, given, you know, the change in how we're working together, um, remote work, hi you know, what's hybrid work? I mean, I'm not sure. I don't even like that word. Um, uh, I how do, how do you adapt? How do we how do we adapt the way we're bringing in innovation inside organizations in the next uh, few years? Well, you know, if if you start with the assumption that like we have all of these new technologies and all these different things we can do, and you know, I write a lot about AI, and I tell people that if we if we if we outlawed any new developments in AI we probably have about 30 years worth of work left to do that we know how to do. We, we just don't have the people and time to do it. Like there, there's a whole lot more we know we can do than we have been able to. And that gap is going to increase because technology is, you know, is, is growing at this rate that the number of things you can do uh, goes way up. And therefore the number of options uh, that you can choose between go way up. And so I think what, maybe change makers need is a way to get through that, all that noise and possibility. And, and I kind of think of two rules that I use. Uh, I don't know if they're particularly great, but one of them is uh, I try to solve problems that people don't expect me to solve. Uh, for instance, I think about, I talked to this person who worked at a television manufacturer and they have a hard time differentiating their product that's commoditized. A 42-inch screen is like, you know. It's so they screen. would go around, they would ask people, like, what do you not like about your TV? And, and people say, I love my TV. My TV's great. And then they would say, do you ever lose the remote control? And they're like, I lose it all the time. And so they're putting 10 cents worth of electronics on that TV to make a button that when you press it, it, it makes the remote play a song. Now, the fact that when you said, what, what problems do you have with your TV? Nobody said, well, my TV does not find my remote for me when I lose it. Because nobody <laughs> thought that was a TV's problem. And it turns out that when you can figure out ways to apply technology to solve problems people aren't even expecting you to solve, then uh, that's powerful. That's powerful. Uh, and and I, I'm sure your listeners can think back to some of the technologies around us. that it's like, oh my gosh, I never expected that to happen. And then the second thing I would say, so solve the problem you're not expected to solve. The other one is study data that other people ignore. So we have all these data sources uh, and everybody kind of like gloms on to the obvious ones. But if you remember Alan Greenspan, he used to be a chairman of the, of the Fed and he, uh, he had two metrics he followed closely. And that was the number of pallets being manufactured in the U.S. and the number of boxes being made. Because he realized that any time for the economy to heat up, you needed more boxes and more pallets. And you always ordered those before you actually saw the increase. And so he would use those as leading indicators. When, when you look around at um, all of these things that we just stumble across in life, I mean, I, I, well, butrin is a popular antidepressant that some people happen to be to say, huh, I was able to stop smoking when I was on that. And then they studied it and they said, oh, my gosh, it, they stopped. it's good for 
and now you can buy it. It's called Zyban, and it's an anti-smoking thing. Like, there's tons and tons of things like that where the data has a story to tell. Data, but you you have to look at, at the right data. So I would study the data that other people ignore. I would find data sources that nobody's looking at because that will really give you a um, a real advantage because you're you're thinking differently than other people and you're looking at data that they're not and therefore you're making different decisions because of that. So I would say those two things. Byron, we've talked about a lot in our conversation thus far, but I, I have to ask the question, what is your why? Why do you wake up every day, dive into writing the books and doing the work that you do? What drives you? When I'm writing, I go downstairs <laughs> frequently and uh, say to my wife, you know, I'm going to finish this book because I'm in a contract, but I'm never going to write another word as long as I live. I'm just not going to do it ever again. Like, this is just too much. It's too much work. And then she just smiles. I don't know why, what that means. Maybe she's heard it before and and the books keep coming out. Um, so my why for my writing is clearly it's just irresistible. I cannot not do it. Even, even though to write the kind of books I write, they have to, if I were writing, and I do, I write these other books I don't publish and they're humor fiction. And you can pick that up after five years and you can keep going and it's, and you, you're telling a story. The kind of books I write, you have to be steeped in them day and night, day and night, day and night, right? And, and so nobody would put themselves through that. And then writing's no fun either for me. I don't enjoy it in the least. I love having written. I love looking back on something that I wrote and saying, I'm very proud of that. But I don't like it in the least. It's a slog. It's not fun. Um, and so I always say that it is that. And then... For my entrepreneurship, I think that too is um, innate. I, I think you know the first the first company I started uh, when I was thirteen that made real money, like to a thirteen year old, real money uh, was I would go around my neighborhood with these stencils and spray paint, and I would offer to paint people's uh, curb numbers on the curbs, and I had this whole spiel about how man, an ambulance could ever find this place, you know, the numbers. And then they would, you know, they would say, okay, all right, I'll do it. $5. Well, for $8, I can get you a little state of Texas flag next to it. Uh, all right, all right, $8, <laughs> I'll do it. And uh, and then, you know, and I didn't love painting them, but man, I love the success of it. I love when it gelled and it worked. And, and, you know, I mean, there were times when I was that age and I had $100 in my wallet, like, that was great. So I think the same thing is like, you can't, I don't think entrepreneurs can like look at a problem and, and not be like, I could, I could, there's a company there. I could, I could solve that. In the words of Joseph Campbell, I think you're the hero with a calling. And uh, <laughs> so but, uh, but Byron, this is, <laughs> he's great. He's, 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 he's worth it. Yeah, yeah wonderful. I, I had to work hard not to, not to quote him too many times in the book. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, he's the person who thought about, you know, uh, George Lucas called him my Yoda. Right. right? Like he was the <laughs> oh, he was. He was. It was uh, that's a whole uh, other. I think we do a whole episode on, on Joseph Campbell and the influence he's had. Um, Stories Nice and Rocks That Think. We will put a link in, in the show notes. Uh, get a copy. It's great. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, Byron, where else should people go to follow you and and keep up with man a lot of a lot of books, a lot of adventures, a lot of companies. Maybe maybe people want to invest in some of these these companies you're doing. It's funny. Before my mother passed away, you know, her wish was that I got a steady job because she felt <laughs> like I couldn't hold a job uh, because every time she said, "What are you doing?" it changed, and I think to her that was like, you know, any case. My name is Byron Reese, and, and you can find me knowing that anywhere. I'm uh, Byron, ByronReese.com. I'm Byron Reese on Twitter. My email address is ByronReese at Gmail. Like, I am the easiest person to find. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, Byron, thank you. Laura, thank you. Thanks to all our listeners. And uh, listen, join us again uh, next week for another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. Thanks. <laughs>